Hello, this is Pastor Sam Velez, and I'm so glad that you're joining us for our service. We hope you enjoy this message today, that it blesses your life and your families. We love you. Today we're starting a brand new series called Seven, and we're talking about the seven letters that Jesus gives to the churches in the book of Revelation. I'm not really going to get too into end times, but we will get there at some point because it's important to understand that, that Jesus is coming back. He prophesied in the Gospels. He gave us warning signs and told us these things are going to happen before I come. And he said, it doesn't mean that I'm coming at that moment. He said, these are called like birth pains. It's letting you know that the time is coming. And he said things like this. He said things in the Gospels like wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all these things. And we've been experiencing a lot of that lately in the last couple of years, which indicates one thing that God is coming. He is coming for his people. But I'm not here to scare any of you. I'm not here to make you feel uncomfortable. But I am here to let you know that when we talk about revelation, it brings a lot of emotions. There are people that maybe you're like, I, I avoid the last book of the Bible because it scares me. And there's a lot of things that I don't understand about it. There's a lot of imagery. And it's true. The book of Revelation has a lot of different metaphor and imagery and all these things. And sometimes it can get very confusing. So when people ask me, how do I explain Revelation? I just tell them one thing. It just means that he's coming back for his people. And we get to be with him forever. Amen? Awesome. But I do want to talk about this because these letters that Jesus writes to the seven churches are just not, they're not just letters to these churches. They are prof, they're called prophetic letters. That means that it doesn't just apply to these churches. It applies to us today. It applies to our lives. It applies to the way we live. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7. Revelation 2 one through seven, and it says this. It says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has... Ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So our reading today is this. Is that Jesus begins to write and he begins to tell the Ephesian church everything that they're doing. At first, Jesus is telling them how great they are. You have to understand something. The Ephesian church, Ephesus, was, in a, was a premier place in those times. It was a harbor. It was a marketplace. Customs, religions, a lot of different things met in that place. Ephesus would be considered today, if you think of Ephesus as a, as a premier city, it would probably be like, if you, if you, it would probably be Los Angeles or New York. A place where people flock from everywhere to go. A place that has notoriety, a place that is famous and is known. And Ephesus was that kind of city. And within Ephesus was the church. And in that time, the church was doing great things for God. In fact, if you go to, I'm not going to read it, but you, on your own time, you can go to Acts chapter 19, where the Holy Spirit comes and fills them, and they begin to speak in tongues. And not only that, but there was a great revival where people began to burn their witchcraft books and, and their sorcery and all these things because they began to turn to God. Great revival happened in that city. So when Jesus is writing to him, he's telling him, man, you do some great things. You've been, you've been man, you've stood the test. You've stood with me. You, you've built something with me. You've done some amazing things for my name. But they were missing something. It's kind of like, have you ever eaten at a restaurant or, you know, at someone's house and, like, they're missing something and it doesn't taste that good? Don't raise your hand or look at your wife or your husband. 
Look at me. Have you ever done that? And it's always the same thing. Le falta sal, like salt. Needs more salt. Ever met those salt people that they just pour? It's like a mountain of salt. It's not enough salt. It's, it's, there's never enough salt for some reason in any meal. But when there's missing, when, let's, say, let's just use that example. When, some, when salt is missing in a meal, it doesn't taste very good. If you're a health person, whatever. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't taste good. And so when it's missing salt, it just doesn't taste the same. It doesn't give you the same feeling. It doesn't, I mean, I've, it happens, it's happened many times. I go to restaurants and they're like, man, there's something missing. It's just, it's not good or it used to be good and they don't make it the same. Have you ever felt like that at a restaurant? They don't make things the same. And it's because it's, mis- it's missing some sort of ingredient. And the same thing is happening in the Ephesian church in this moment. They had everything going for them, but they were missing one thing. It was love. Jesus said, you're doing great things for me, but you're missing one thing, and that's love. See, church, if we're not careful, we could be like the Ephesian church. We can, do, we can accomplish many things in our life. But if we do not have love, God is not pleased. You can accomplish a lot of things. You can be a multimillionaire. You can build your business, build your family. You could have everything going for you. But if you lack love, God's not pleased. God's not pleased. In fact, it's not going to be up there, but if you, if you want to look at it real quick, this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. He said this, Paul said this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Church, in other words, it doesn't matter what you do on the outside if there is no love on the inside There's nothing. And Paul said it best. He said, all it is is a bunch of noise. Ever had a kid play drums and they know how to play drums and it's just banging everything? A bunch of of noise, but no sound. And Paul's saying, hey, if you're going to do anything, do it with love. And Jesus is telling me today that if me and you are going to produce something, produce it with love. Do it out of love because if I can get my love back, if I can return my love for God, it will also change the way I love people. Because Jesus said it himself. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, all your mind, and all, all your soul, and all your strength. And then he said love your neighbor as yourself. But here's the thing. The foundation is simply this. It's love. I can't love someone next to me if I can't love God first. And so Jesus begins to give them a criteria to come back. A criteria to come back to your first love, basically. To come back to loving God fully once again. Because if I can love God fully once again, it will change the way I live and the way I operate as a person. doesn't matter how old you are. If you lack love, you're lacking. You're lacking. You can be a multimillionaire, but if you don't have love, you're still lacking. So he gives us three things today. If you're taking notes, if we want to come back to our first love, the first thing he tells us is we need to remember. Is that we need to remember. We need to remember. There are some moments where remembering can be very dangerous. And then there's also moments where remembering can also be very productive. But Jesus is saying remember Remember your first love. Remember how it started. Remember when you first gave your life to Jesus. Remember what I did. See, church, we have to understand if we're going to get back to our first love, we have to remember why we 
are how we are with God, how we got here. The reason why me and you are sitting here is because God loved us first. And God saved us. And God took us from where we are to how we are now. And God healed my body. And God opened the door. Because of God's love, we and you are able to be here today. And Jesus is saying this morning, remember that. Remember what I did. Remember that I died on the cross for you. Remember that I loved you even when you didn't love me. Remember when I sent my Holy Spirit on you and you were filled with the Holy Spirit and you, had to, you, couldn't, you couldn't contain it. Remember those moments because those are the things that are going to give you the passion to come back. Jesus is telling me and you that we have to have a passion, a love for him once again. Because if we're not careful, church, we will do the routine things like the Ephesian church. They gave to the poor. They stood for Jesus in a... Let me tell you something. The Ephesian church were in the middle of wickedness. Wicked things were happening. There was revival and there was wickedness happening. And they stood the test. They stood their ground. It's like if you lived in New York and you stand your ground, you're not trying to be like the culture. Or L.A., They stood their ground. But Jesus said, you're doing a lot of great things for me, but you forgot about me. We can come to church and lift our hands and still not love Jesus. Still not be passionate about him. You know how you know when your passion is running out and your love for him? When this becomes a burden. When worshiping, when worship becomes a burden, when praying becomes a burden. When Pastor Sam asks us to serve, it becomes a burden. That's when you know your passion is running and your love is running. When everything that has to do with the Lord becomes a burden to you, that's when you have to think about it. Okay, this is getting dangerous. When I was getting my master's, I I did my master's in this, it's called ministerial leadership. Basically, if I went to a secular college, it would be organizational leadership, See, like if I wanted to be a CEO kind of thing. And we had to read this book. It was a business book, but it was by Simon Sinek. And it was this book called Why. And basically, this, bis- this book is helping business people. It could also help pastors and any, any person in this room, actually. But this book was, is specifically about why you do what you do. Because if you don't know your why, it will affect your what. And if we're not careful, it can happen to our personal lives. If we forget why we are here, if we forget why we came in the first place, if we forget why God does what he does, it affects how we live. It affects how we live. That's why when I sang this song and I made us continue to sing it, I wanted to get that in your spirit, that we're only here for Jesus and Jesus alone. We're here because we have a king that's still in the throne. And he still reigns above us. We're not here for anything else. We're not here for a concert. We're not here for, for anything else. We're here for God. And God alone. But if I forget why I'm here, I'll lose everything that God's trying to do. I'll miss out. I'll miss out on the miracles. I'll miss out on the transformation. I'll miss out because I forgot why. I forgot why. It can happen in our personal life. Why? That question why goes in every area. Why you got got into the job you're in. Why you became a parent. Because I know sometimes your kids can drive you crazy. Why? You're like, why did I want kids sometimes? Because you love them. Remember that. But why? And Jesus says, remember your first love. Remember. Remember. Some of you today, you have to remember that God does love you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Not just for God so loved Christians, the world, that he sent his son to die for me and you. So if you came in this room and you don't know Jesus, Jesus died for you. And Jesus loves your life. He loves you enough. This is a, for some of you in this room, you are here by divine appointment. Whether you came here because someone forced you, you came here out of curiosity, you came here, God had a divine appointment for you to be here. Because he loves you that much. 
because he loves you that much. And if I can receive God's love for me and understand that I'm, I live out of a place of love, it will transform my life. Because see, see love out of, for men will bring about fear. Love for God brings freedom. And when I accept that in my life, it brings a whole different freedom. Because when I live out of love for men and women, like when I, no, here's what I mean. When I live out of love for people and I'm trying to gain their love, it's always going to bring some sort of anxiety and some sort of fear because it's almost like I'm trying to work for your approval. I'm trying to work for your acceptance. I'm trying to work for you to like me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work, work, work. But if I can understand that God loves me from the, from the get-go, it brings a freedom because that means that I don't have to work for God's love. He loves me. Everyone in this room, you have to understand that today. This is going to end the war that's in your life. The battle in your life. Because sometimes in this room, there are people in this room that are working for God. And God's saying, you don't have to work for my love. I already love you. Some of you in this room, you are working for the approval of God. And God says, I already approve of you. And this will set you free. Because if you know that from the get-go that God loves you, then I work differently. I don't work for God's love. I don't work for God. I work from a place of love. I work from a place, man, that guy, I'm accepted. As a parent in this room, your kids know that you love them. They don't have to work for your love. They don't have to do anything. Although sometimes you're like, man, I'll give you 10 bucks, walk, clean the house. I'll love you better. You know, we make jokes like that. But in reality is, our kids don't have to do nothing. We love them. My daughters, I love them. They, ha- they don't have to do anything for my love. I love them unconditionally. I love my wife unconditionally. Nobody that is I love has to do anything. My friendships, my friends, they don't have to do nothing. I love them unconditionally. In an oration with God, it's the same thing. He loves me and you unconditionally. And we have to remember that. Because if not, serving God will become a burden. If not, Christianity won't be real. It'll, it'll always be a burden for people. So he says, I need you to remember. And then he says, I need you to repent. That's the second point. He says, I need you to repent. If you're new today, repentance is very different from sorry. Repentance is I am turning away to a different direction. I was here, and because I repented, I am now going over there. Repentance in the Bible means a turnaround, a change of direction. In other words, what he's saying is if you want to relive this love, if you want to live a new life with me, if you want these things, then you need to change the direction of your life. You need to change the direction. You need to change the direction of your thought process. You need to change the direction of how you process things and how you speak to people and how you work. You need to change. You need to repent and do an about face and go to the blessings and go to the promises of God and go towards God. You need to change. That's why in the Bible you can see this all the time in the Gospels. The book of, we all read the book of Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector, you know how repentance looks like? The Bible says that when Jesus told him to come, he dropped everything and he followed him. When Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house, what does Zacchaeus do? He repented. How did he repent? He said, I'm going to give back four times what I stole from people. That's repentance. Repentance is I'm completely changing what I used to do so that I can be obedient to Christ. So I can change. That's what repentance is. And Jesus is saying this. To the church, he's telling me today, if me and you want to experience this once again, we must repent. Sometimes we got to repent because of our pride. Sometimes we got to repent because of the thoughts we have. There's a many indicating factors. I cannot tell you what to repent for because I don't live inside you. But between you and God, you know exactly what you need to change. Is it a habit? Is it things that you say? Is it things that you think about? Between you and God, you know best. I don't, like I said, I don't live inside you. I'm not Jesus. But you know what you need to repent of. You know exactly what you need to change. 
And this is, not, this is not to shame anybody, but this is to bring an awareness, man, that if I want to experience everything that heaven has for me, I got to change my direction. I got to change my life. I, I got to do something different. I got to walk away from certain things. I got to cut out things that I'm allowing in my life. I got to do something that will bring a transformation in my life. And that can only happen when I am repentant. Because sorry doesn't cut it. We say sorry all the time, and a lot of times we don't mean it. Like, oh, I'm sorry. But you still do it again. Ever met people that tell you sorry and they keep doing it again? You tell them, hey, you did it again. You did it again. You did it again. Because they never repented. They were just sorry. I use this joke all the time with everybody because it's so true. When, when your parents make you hug your brother and sister after you fight, say sorry to each other. You say sorry to each other, but you didn't mean it. You just want to get out of it. Like, I'm, t- I'm, I'm trying to get out of this hug with my brother my, or, or if you have a sister or my sister. You get it over with. But repentance is like, man, I, I am sorry, and because I am sorry, I'm going to do something different about it. Whatever, the, whatever it takes, whatever I got to do, I'll change. And repentance to the Lord is simply that. I, I, God, I repent. I've been doing this, and I'm giving this to you, and I'm never going back to it again. I'm going to change. I'm going to let that go. And for some of you in this room, it will, it is, you have to understand, it, sometimes it could be the hardest thing. Repentance can be very hard for some people. Because you're cutting away from something that you've lived with for years. You've lived with it for years. You've lived this habit for years. You've, you've lived in this, this behavior for years. You've lived in this thought process for years. And for some people, it's very hard to just break off it. Like, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I, I, I've always thought like this. I've always lived like this. I've always spoken like this. It's just been who I am. But can I encourage you with this? That when you gave your life to Jesus, the Bible says that you are a new creation in him. The old is gone. The new has come. The old is gone. It's erased. The new has come. So because you're a new person, it means you're doing new things. And you're living in new ways. And, and the old you can't come. Can't come anymore. The old you can't be a part of your life anymore. And if we can be honest, the old you is the reason why you had the problems that you had. The old you gave you issue after issue, whether it's in your marriage or in your personal life. The old you brings destruction. The new you brings transformation. It brings a production in your life that is different. So Jesus says to remember, and then he tells us to repent, to turn away, to change direction. And this morning, for some of you, you need to evaluate your life and say, man, what am I doing that needs to change? Lord, and even in your prayer time, Lord, reveal to me, are there things in my life that I'm doing? And Holy Spirit, convict me. Bring conviction. That's why I love King David. King David, the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. And this is why. He lived to please the Lord no matter what. And in the book of Psalms, he would t- say things like this, Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and bring about anything that dishonors you. In other words, God, show me what I'm doing wrong so I can do something about it. Not many people pray like that anymore. Because when we ask God to show us, a lot of times there are things that we are connected to that we can't let go of. But can I be honest with you? We, we, we pray prayers like this. God, give me a breakthrough. But breakthrough means I'm breaking off of something that God never intended. It requires me to break from that thing. Break from toxic people. Break from toxic mindsets. Break from anything that is putting a division between you and God. Because the devil has come to destroy your life. That's what the Bible says. The steel can destroy. Jesus, I have come to you. You have life and life in abundance. So God has come to give you a brand new life and a better life. A fruitful life. A peaceful life. 
a life of blessing, a life that produces something better than what you ever had before. Whatever you had before. So he says, remember, in this whole passage, he says, remember, repent, and then he says, return. He says, go back to what you did at first. He says, go back to what you did. And to be honest, go back to what you did. He doesn't say what to do because those are the fill in, bl- those are fill in the blanks that you need to fill. Those are things that you need to decide in your heart. What did I do before? Before, when I, when I started this relationship with God, when I, when I was passionate about God and when I was loving on people and I was doing all these things, what, how, did I, how did I do it when I first started? How was my prayer life? How was my time with the Lord? How was my devotion to him? Jesus says, you got to go back to, to that. You, so for some of you in this room, it's just simply this. you got to go back to the basics. You got to go back to the basics and remember why. Because when, you, when we first get into this relationship with God, we are passionate about God. We're hungry for the Lord. And then within time, if we're not careful, it begins to fade and grow cold. And the moment it grows cold, it leads us to sin. And we don't want to grow cold. We don't want to be like the Ephesian church. Where, man, we're doing all these things and it looks awesome and it's Instagram worthy. But, man, there is no love. There is no love. For some people, it's I'm looking for love on social media. But I'm not looking for love from God. I get this amount of likes. I feel accomplished. Since when has the likes of social media come before God? Church, we live and we work for the audience of one. Whether we get a thousand likes or no likes, who cares? The only one that's watching that matters is God. That's the only, that's the only person that matters. I'm not against social media. I have social media, but I don't live from social media. In other words, I don't live out of that place that I need. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die without it. I grew up in the 90s, man. We didn't even have phones back then. All right, so... We had to write letters to each other and walk to houses and write, actually be outside. Y'all remember those days? Some of you, the young kids today, they don't know. But but he says, you got to return to it. You got to come back to whatever that process is. You got to start again. Church, can I be honest with you? What's going to transform this church and our city is going to be the hunger of people for God. It's going to be how hungry we are for him, how much much devotion, how much desire. Can I be honest with you? Hunger is the the table that's set for revival. We say things like, I want revival in my city. Well, it starts with hunger. It starts with a passion for God. Because the Bible says, those that hunger and thirst shall be filled. But there is no filling without hunger. Without desire, without man, God, what can I do? God, how can I, how can I get back? Church, once you begin to be transformed by this, it only transforms your love for God, it transforms your love for other people. Because you begin to see people the way God sees them. And you begin to have compassion for people. As much, maybe some of you in this room, sometimes families can annoy us and get us very mad. We start throwing fajita at each other at the house. I don't know. Sometimes our families can really, um, okay, the cleanest way I can say is really make you mad. Really make you upset. But in the middle of all that, we're still called to love them. As much as they, they can, man, take the worst out of us, we're called to love them. And I can only love them if I first have love for the Lord. 
because it allows me to transform not only myself, but the way I approach people. As much as they bother me, as much as they... Ang- We're not always going to agree on everything. It's obvious. Come to the elections. We're not always going to agree on everything. We are still called to love. Whether you are Democrat or Republican, you're still called to love each other. If you're independent, it doesn't matter. You don't count. You can... We're called to love. We're called to love, whether we agree or not. You might not agree with me. I might not agree with you, but it doesn't change how I love you. I wish I, I, it doesn't change. And it doesn't change how we love, how God loves us. It doesn't change anything. In fact, you have to remember one thing, church, that when we give our lives to Jesus, we have a new identity. We are sons and daughters of God. We're sons and daughters. That means that every blessing belongs to me and you. Every inheritance, that every promise that the Bible has belongs for me and you. And when I can accept that identity, it gives me a new confidence, a new way of living, a new way of walking. It gives me a confidence that no one can steal from me because I know who my father is. That there should be a confidence in me and you that says, hey, I'm a son and daughter of God. Man, healing belongs to me. Breakthrough belongs to me. The promises are still yes and amen for me. I'm still loved. Amen. Thank you so much for joining our service and for listening to us. We are located at 4519 East Del Mar Boulevard in Laredo, Texas. And we hope that you continue to be a part of our ICM family.